people always ask us, how do you come up with an idea for an exhibition? And my co-curator and Emma and I thought the 1970s was completely timely. In fact, interestingly, many of the magazines that we've been looking at over the past few months have been featuring this whole revival of the 1970s. I think what separates this exhibition from virtually every other one we have done in the main gallery is that we rely completely on our permanent collection. The museum at FIT has the strongest and most comprehensive holdings of Halston in the world. And we also have a very, very strong Yves Saint Laurent collection. For all that has been done on these two designers, the books, the exhibitions, even films and documentaries, nobody's ever juxtaposed them. Halston was a great designer slash dressmaker. Most people don't know this. He was a genius at construction. What I found most interesting is that he started off as a milliner or a hat maker, somebody who made rigid, constructed elements, much the way Charles James did. But unlike James, who made gowns that were so rigid they could almost stand up on their own, Halston believed in softness and fluidity and really believed in creating garments for the modern woman. He also was someone who eliminated all superfluous trimmings and ornamentation and really focused on clothes that would highlight that natural body. When I first started to look at the work of Yves Saint Laurent, I definitely held the same mindset that a lot of people do, mainly that he was a couturier in the classic sense, someone who created true fantastical and dreamy designs with a high sense of drama in them. But when I started to examine not only the garments themselves in our collection, but also the holdings of our special collections library, what I realized is that during the 1970s, particularly the early years, Reeve Gauche, his ready-to-wear line, was actually extremely important for his development, not only as a designer, but also for the development of his business and his celebrity status. We saw both designers going through tremendous transformation and change in the late 1960s. Great social upheaval, political upheaval, was also showing its wear on the fashion industry. Emma and I discovered as we started to look at the objects how remarkably similar the two of them were in the early part of the decade particularly. We were struck sometimes that when we paired these similar objects next to one another, you couldn't tell who had designed what. And so the way in which we really wanted to show the differentiation between the two was to pick a handful of themes that were very important in the 1970s. One of them was the rise of menswear. And here we see, in most cases, the more literal translation of menswear by Saint Laurent and a really marked departure by Halston. Holston decided to make almost a unisex uniform. He wore himself a black turtleneck, often made out of cashmere, very simple slim cut trousers, and either a cardigan or a jacket. He made those same elements for a woman's wardrobe. The other thing that he was very good at was taking a simple object from a man's wardrobe, for example, a man's shirt, and turning it into one of the most successful garments ever made in the American fashion industry his famous shirtwaist dress, and what made it really successful was the fact he made it with an important synthetic called ultra suede. When he first discovered ultra suede, it turns out he was having dinner in Paris and was seated next to the great Japanese designer Issei Miyake. Miyake was telling him about ultra suede, and Halston misunderstood its physical attributes. He thought Miyake was saying it was waterproof rather than machine washable, so Halston's first experiment was a trench coat. Well, clearly, an absorbent <laughs> fabric was the wrong thing to choose, but this happy accident, in fact, turned out to be one of his most successful pieces. Without a doubt, the most famous example of Yves Saint Laurent looking to menswear in his women's clothing was his Le Smoking, or tuxedo for a woman. He first debuted it in 1966, but kept on reintroducing different versions of it throughout the rest of his career. He followed up the Le Smoking with a gangster style pinstripe double-breasted suit. He then showed a very successful, now iconic, safari look. And then throughout the 1970s, these grew into a whole range of essentials for the modern woman's wardrobe. Exoticism was very important during the 1970s. If you look at the work of Halston, you see that he created a more narrow range of clothes and was far less literal in his translation of non-Western clothes than Saint Laurent. Halston used the bias, 
cut, cutting on an angle and draping on an angle, unlike any other designer before him. By draping on the bias, he steps away from the more traditional process of cutting indigenous clothing on the straight grain. And by doing this, I think pushes American fashion towards couture in a way nobody had before. Often used almost always solid patterned fabrics. I think this area, this exoticism section that we have, um, actually is one of the few places where you'll see him use patterned fabrics. Whereas Halston was looking to non-Western and exoticism to influence his construction, Yves Saint Laurent was much more looking at the exotic as a source of decorative elements for his clothing. An extremely important influence on Saint Laurent was the work of Paul Poiré in the early 20th century. The same use of color and drama and fantasy ran throughout Paul Poiré's work and really set an example for Saint Laurent. Yves Saint Laurent's most famous collections are probably undoubtedly his Russian or Belarus collection of 1976 closely followed by his Chinese or opium collection the following year. Opium first came on the market in 1977 in France, and it caused an absolute sensation. It started outselling fragrances like Chanel No. 5 in less than three months, and when it came over to the US, it was launched with a blowout party on board a boat, the Peking, and then ended with a colossal after party at Studio 54. Though, Opium did spark some controversies in New York. Within a year, it was selling $5 million. Interestingly, though YSL is remembered so much for these exotic creations or non-Western fashions, he actually never traveled to these places. Though he had a house in Marrakesh and was himself from Algeria, he never traveled to China before he designed these collections. He never traveled to Russia. He was essentially an armchair explorer. One of the things that we found that was celebrated throughout that time period was their own personal design styles, mainly their homes. And Yves Saint Laurent had not only homes that were uh, very much in the historical tradition of French furniture and design, he also did have Orientalism uh, sort of strewn throughout his life as well. Uh, Halston conversely had one of the most famous homes in New York City, a townhouse designed by Paul Rudolph. The New York Times ran a major article about the house saying that it did evoke the very essence of what Halston's work was about, modern, streamlined, and beautifully detailed. Another section that's very important is the influence of historical referencing to these designers. Again, Halston doesn't take the references quite so literally, and he's not so expansive in his use of historical references. You don't see buttons and zippers on his clothes. He often had hidden hooks and eyes. He didn't believe in having any ostentatious decorative element, even for closures. So his idea was to hide that as much as possible. And one source of inspiration for that was not only Madeleine Vionnet, but Claire McArdle, the pioneering American designer. Yves Saint Laurent, when looking at historical periods, really took inspiration from two periods in particular. The interwar years of the 1920s, 30s, as well as the 1940s. Then on the other hand, he looked at the late 19th century period of the Belle Epoque. They showed his indebtedness to two important couturiers. On the one hand, the looks that he derived from the interwar years show his indebtedness to Chanel the modernity, the androgyny of these adaptations. Likewise, the volume and the femininity and the drama of his Belle Epoque period designs really show how closely he was still looking to the designs of Christian Dior in his work, even in the 1970s. We felt it was important to put both designers within historical context, not only to trace the development of their particular careers, but to show the business developments and cultural developments that had a lot of influence, not only on them, but the fashion industry at large. While Saint Laurent had a champion in Pierre Berger, who was not only his business partner, but if you will, his champion and legacy maker, Halston did not. Emma ended the timeline in 1984 when Halston lost the right to his own name. And so it was sort of a, uh, I guess a lesson to be learned for younger designers on how to move forward as your business expands. While Saint Laurent had a more expansive, longer career, Halston is really thought of as penultimate, if you will, 1970s designer. But in both cases that decade was so important 
in expanding the vocabulary of what fashion could be. And I don't think two people did it better, or crystallized the idea of 1970s better than Yves Saint Laurent and Halston.